the cartoon is based on a couplet by uh, Ogden Nash. The rain, it raineth every day on the rich and on the poor fella. But the poor get wetter than the rich because the rich has poor's umbrella. And I think that captures exactly what is happening with climate change and with the problem of equity. I'd like to take us through the debates both on the issue of international equity and on the issue of domestic uh, equity. So uh, let me quickly begin with an overview of the Paris Agreement. And those of you who have followed the discussions in the newspapers, in commentaries, in blogs, etc., would know that the Paris Agreement was broadly welcomed by virtually everybody, by, of course, all governments, but even surprisingly by a large number of civil society organizations. Those big international NGOs and others who have been at the forefront of the discussions on climate change have also broadly welcomed uh, the Paris Agreement. My own view is that the good thing about the Paris Agreement is that 195 countries have agreed on the fact of man-made climate change, the governments of these countries. So it's no longer going to be easy for any government to take a climate denial uh, position. Uh, Trump may do it. But, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's going to be difficult for governments to do so because governments have gone on record now to say, yeah, we recognize uh, man-made climate change. The second is that some binding national targets have actually been set uh, at Paris through the medium of these voluntary pledges by uh, various countries. Now, I... Uh, I'm not a woolly-eyed optimist to think that this marks a great victory. Uh, I fully understand the limitations of both these. The fact that governments have agreed and the fact that countries have pledged to do various things. But I believe that it at least gives the rest of us a platform for continuing struggle. There is something on the basis of which you can start the struggle and say, look, you guys have committed to this. So let's start with that. I'm going to hold your feet to the fire and let's go to the next uh, step. The Paris Agreement, in my view, is not good from three main points of view. The first is the global agreement, the Paris Agreement's goal is to limit the impact of climate change to keep global average surface temperature rise to a maximum of 2 degrees Celsius. In fact, the wordings of the Paris Agreement are actually more ambitious. It says, well below 2 degrees Celsius. And to the extent possible, we will aim at 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius. This is new, uh, this ambitious statement of a goal in the run-up to Paris at previous COPs in Cancun and Durban, etc. There was only a hint of looking even beyond 2 degrees. See, Paris Agreement formally states we'll go well beyond 2 degrees and look at uh, 1.5. But all the INDCs, which different countries have pledged. Different countries have said, we will cut our emissions by so much. If you add all those up together, it comes nowhere near 2 degrees. If all countries reduce their emissions by as much as they said, as they have said they would, we are still looking at 3 to 3.5 degrees Celsius rise in temperature. There is a gap between what has been pledged and what is required to meet a 2 degrees Celsius goal in terms of emission reductions on top of what has been pledged by different countries, you still need to reduce global emissions 
by somewhere between 12 to 15 gigatons, that's a billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, uh, you need to reduce by that much if you want to meet uh, 2 degrees Celsius. Various things could have been done uh, in Paris to try and achieve this, but the very framework of the Paris Agreement was, and one of the supposedly methods which have assured the success of the Paris Summit was, unlike the earlier Kyoto Protocol, which set a top-down target and prescribed every country, developed country, must reduce its emissions from 1990 levels Minor, it should be minus 5.6% uh, by the year 2008. That was a flat target set. Argument by the US in particular and by most developed countries is this top-down target didn't work <laughs> in Kyoto. Uh, so this time, let us do a voluntary bottom-up target. We will not set a target for everybody. Let everybody set their own targets. So the US said, I will do so much. The European Union says, I will do so much. X, Y, Z said, I will do so much. So because these are all voluntary pledges, therefore the idea is that you are more likely to obey and to follow that rather than a target set by somebody else from above. Uh, to my mind, uh, very flawed architecture for the Paris Agreement. Uh, I like to use a cricket analogy, which I hope those of you who don't follow cricket would be able to follow. And that is, uh, if you've got a one-day match in cricket, and the team that has batted first has scored 250 runs. The team batting second aims to cross 250 runs. It's certainly not helpful if the team that's batting second, the opening batsman says, I'll score 20. The guy who comes second says, I'll score 22. Third guy says, I'll score 30. But the total comes up to only 200. You must know what the target is and you must have a team effort to cross that. What we have done is to do this. Every chap has put up his hand and said, I'll do so much, and there is no third empire, body, group, captain, manager, who will see, does this total up to the goal that you want? It doesn't. And that's a big problem with the pledge and review system, but that's what we have got. At the heart of the architecture set by the Paris Agreement is that it is a deeply inequitable agreement. And I'll explain why. The first and most important part of this is the Paris Agreement ignores what are called historical emissions. That is, emissions which have already gone before. Climate change is caused by the accumulation of greenhouse gases, mainly carbon dioxide, but also methane, uh, CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, uh, nitrous oxides, primarily carbon dioxide, since the dawn of the industrial era. You can say from 1850 onwards is taken as a baseline. Who has put all these gases there? <coughs> India was not an industrial power in 1850. China was not an industrial power in 1850. Who are the industrial powers in 1850? The British, the Germans, the French, the Europeans in general, and the Americans. They had steam uh, factory-driven factories. They had steam ships going all over uh, the world. They had steam engines transporting uh, goods. They were the guys who were causing this explosion in carbon dioxide. And we know today that 77% of the 
of the blanket of carbon dioxide that we have got surrounding the earth has been put there by the developed countries since 1850 to date. The Kyoto Protocol takes this into account. The UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the foundation of all these discussions, says because there has been this long history of pollution which has resulted in this blanket of carbon dioxide which is causing climate change, following the well-established principle in international law and of ethics uh, internationally, and that's the principle that the polluter pays. He who has polluted <coughs> pays for the damage or is responsible for the problem and therefore is responsible for its solution. By ignoring historical emissions, the Paris Agreement has therefore said what has happened in the last 170 years, let's just forget about it and now let us look at the future. So the 77% of carbon dioxide which has been put there by the developed countries is already there. Forget that. Now just let's look forward. And as I am fond of saying, uh, and then you sort of argue, India is huge country, growing, high GDP growth rate, China is like this. So let's look for a fair solution and the fair solution the Americans and the Europeans would like to put forward is let's be fair you also reduce we also reduce but like I say this is like the fat guy who has eaten all the food available and the thin guy who has not eaten much of the food all this time are today left with the situation where there is very little food left and the fat guy says let's be fair you also reduce your intake by half, I'll also reduce my intake by half. So the fat guy will become lean and fit and the thin guy will die. This is the framework of the Paris Agreement which we are left with today, which is the implication of ignoring the past. If you're only looking forward and then saying you also cut, I also cut, this puts an uneven uh, emphasis uh, and burden of the responsibility onto the shoulders of the developing uh, countries. So it deals only with the future emissions. It avoids the very deep cuts by the industrialized countries, which has been called for by the science. Successive reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has said, because the developed countries have, are responsible for 80% of the problem, they should take responsibility for proportionately, let's say, 80% of the solution going forward and make very deep cuts in their uh, emissions going forward. Maybe by as much as 90 to 95% by the middle of this century, they should reduce their emissions. The emission cuts promised by the developed countries goes nowhere near that number. In fact, today, the developing countries together, China, India, Brazil, South Africa, Indonesia, a group of 20 large developing countries put together, the cuts promised by them in absolute terms amounts to about two and a half times the emissions reductions promised by the developed countries. Clearly, this is highly unequal. A problem caused by the developed countries the bulk of the solution is being put forward by the uh, developing countries for a problem caused by the developed uh, nations. The second thing is this promise of 1.5 degrees Celsius or well under 2 degrees. If the above problem that we have just talked about is already there with a goal of 2 degrees, Tomorrow, if a goal of 1.5 degrees, then more cuts are called for. And who is going to make these cuts? If already the greater proportion is falling on the shoulders of India and China and others, it stands to reason that if you are going to aim at 1.5, even more pressure will be put on China and India to take on more burden, saying, please, unless you do it, you know, the world is going to collapse. So, 
you have to do this. The numbers given by the fifth assessment report of the IPCC tell us we can look at this problem in terms of a global carbon budget. That is to say, the atmosphere as a whole can hold a finite amount of carbon dioxide. That's all it can hold if you want temperature not to cross 2 degrees uh, Celsius. To meet that carbon budget, from the beginning till now, a total budget of 3,000 gigatons, billion tons of carbon dioxide was available from 1850 onwards. Out of that, 2,000 has already been used up. So we are left with a balance of 1,000 <coughs> gigatons. If you take all the INDCs which have been pledged by the different countries, that already totals up to 750. So we are left with a budget of 250 gigatons to play with in the future, which has to be divided between US, Europe, China, India, Brazil, South Africa, Indonesia, etc., 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 out of which then each country will be told, you only have so much left. Now imagine if India, with all its necessities for the future, needs to do building of infrastructure, poverty alleviation, uh, provisioning of health, all this will require energy. If you expend that energy, you're likely to emit carbon dioxide, but you're being told now, America has done what it has to do, Europe has done what it has to do, we, they will reduce. But India, you must now tighten your belt. We already have no notches left in our belt to tighten, but in the future, looking forward, you have very little what I will call carbon space. Now, I'd like to quickly come to India's position at the Paris uh, Agreement and what that tells us about the commitment that India has made uh, in Paris, the INDC that India has put forward. As you all know, India has, right from the beginning of the negotiations in the UN Framework Convention from Rio 1990s, early 90s onwards, India had rightly pointed to the fact that if you have to have a discussion on how to control emissions, who is to do how much, then this can only be done by using as a metric, as a measure, the idea of emissions per capita, per person. That is to say, you take the world as a whole and you say, what is, this is the total carbon space available in the atmosphere. So per person, whether he's in America or Europe or in India, is entitled to so much. That's his uh, share. So per capita emissions should be a yardstick or a measure by which you apportion uh, responsibilities. However, over the years, India shifted away from this position. And during the glory years of uh, PM Manmohan Singh and his love affair with the United States, looking for a strategic partnership, uh, etc., you would remember uh, George W. Bush had started convening these G5 meetings, which then became the G8 meetings with the inclusion of Russia and China in them. And then the G8 expanded to G8 plus 5, where at uh, George W's insistence, countries like India, South Africa, Brazil were also invited. That became the G8 plus 5, which started being called the Major Economies Forum. So the G5, the G8 used to have its meeting two days, and on the third day, India and Brazil and others would come. That would be the major economies forum, which gradually climate activists started calling the major emitters forum, because these were the leading, uh, the countries with the highest emissions uh, in the world. And then this morphed into the G20. 
India was very enamored with this arrangement. India felt we were finally now sitting at the high table of international diplomacy. You are now playing with the big boys. Uh, and in the interests of being admitted to this club of the big boys, we went along with the formulations which were essentially being advanced by the United States on a variety of global issues, including on climate change. And if you will observe, I have written on this extensively elsewhere, the formulations on climate change that shifted the argument from the earlier framework of the Kyoto Protocol to the framework which we now see in the Paris Agreement started shifting from before Copenhagen, got solidified at the Copenhagen uh, summit and through Cancun, Durban and finally Paris has got crystallized into the new architecture of the Paris Agreement. So totally different architecture from the Kyoto Protocol. But you will notice key formulations of the Paris Agreement go back to Copenhagen and all these formulations at Copenhagen were spelt out in the G8 plus 5 and the MEF forum outside of the UN Framework Convention and essentially at the um, high table of global diplomacy led by the United States and therefore it comes as no surprise that this framework essentially represents what the United States has been pursuing for a long time in climate. You know that the United States first signed on to the Kyoto Agreement and then backed out, was not a member uh, of the uh, Kyoto uh, Protocol, arguing that the US could not accept a framework which had this big differentiation between the developed and the developing countries. So they kept pushing for what they called a single framework. One framework which will govern all the countries, which is what they have got uh, in Paris uh, now, with some differentiation. You do less, I'll do more, a little bit of that, but essentially a single framework with no strict differentiation between the two and with no acceptance of responsibility. The biggest problem of the ignoring of historical emissions is the US does not today face any liability. You can't hold the US now responsible anymore for saying since 1850 you and other developed countries have been emitting so much carbon dioxide. That is why climate change has been caused and therefore you owe the developing countries compensation or reparations or uh, some uh, form of recompense for the damage that you have done, nobody can say that uh, anymore. It's the same argument which Big Tobacco has been uh, arguing for a long time, saying we can't help it, we didn't know what uh, tobacco would do and what smoking would do and stuff like that way. So we cannot be held responsible for any past uh, actions. It's the same that we have got today. While recognizing that India has moved its position in the international negotiations, we should also recognize that India is caught in a dilemma. What's that dilemma? If you look at all hard indicators, poverty levels, infant mortality levels, maternal mortality levels, education levels, primary health care levels. India stands somewhere between 110 to 130 in the list of countries in terms of ranking. If you look at HDI uh, tables and at HDI indicators, India is more or less on par with sub-Saharan Africa. By any objective standards, that's where India stands. But at the same time, India today has got uh, huge GDP growth. India likes to proclaim it's the fastest growing major economy in the world. Uh, it's got huge GDP potential, the biggest middle class after uh, uh, China, claims for a seat in the Security uh, Council, 
wants a place in the sun as a global power, if not as a big regional uh, player. So India is caught between these two. Actually speaking, if you look at all objective indicators, India ranks with the least developed countries. But in terms of its ambitions, in terms of its projections, in terms of its aspirations, it ranks with the top levels of countries of the uh, world. It also ranks among the top countries of the world in terms of emissions. India today is the fourth largest uh, country by emissions in the world. Not surprising given the industrial activities that have taken place and the fact that you are a country of 1.3 billion uh, people. You are going to be uh, to have large emissions. But I think India had not reckoned with India is in this dilemma. How do we reconcile this dilemma and resolve it in the international arena? How do we reconcile this? I think India missed uh, a big opportunity to reassess its own position from a geopolitical viewpoint. And I think the reason why India missed this opportunity is its eyes were only on the United States. Every position it took, it weighed it by saying, what is the US going to say? George W, what is he going to say when we have dinner with them at the G8 uh, meeting? Whereas still then, India's traditional allies in the UN Framework Convention had been the least developed countries, uh, the island uh, states. We had been arguing on everybody else's behalf. This is what the developing countries need to do and this is what the developed countries need to do. Suddenly India had forgotten all those countries and was happy having dinner and confabulations with the US and with the Europeans uh, sitting in the G8 plus uh, five. As a result of which, over a period of time, the small island states in particular, the least developed countries also, started seeing India as much of a problem as the US in Europe and not as part of the solution. This was further added fuel by the fact that India's position in the international fora at Durban, at Cancun, etc. was we are a developing country, we don't want, need to do anything, the problem has been caused by the developed countries, you solve the problem, we have nothing to do. This was not a message you could sell to the world, to the international community, and in particular to the island states and to the least developed countries. As I said, India was already the fourth, if not the third largest emitting nation in the world. Uh, you could see India developing rapidly, sitting in the G8 meetings, all the LDCs and the African group and the island nations could see India sitting there with George W. Uh, at these meetings and then for India to say no, 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 we've got nothing to do with it, we are a poor developing country was not an argument that India could sell uh, abroad. If you look at those top two uh, figures that you see, the pie chart here, if you look at these here, the chart on the left shows you that the developed countries are responsible for 80% of the emissions up there. Developing countries including China, 20%. But if you look at the position going forward, the second pie chart there, you will see that developing countries, which is in yellow, are already responsible for 55% of the emissions in the future going forward. And by 2050, this is going to become 75%. This is a reality. This is why the fourth assessment report of the IPCC released in 2007, which I regard as a watershed in the scientific assessment of the climate change problem, had while asking for developed countries to make deep cuts in their emissions, had also said that developing countries need to deviate below the baseline in terms of their emissions, meaning we can't make absolute cuts. 
but we can slow down our increase. Today, India is growing at 4% per annum in emissions. We need not grow at 4, we can maybe grow at 3 and gradually slow down our rate of growth so that sooner or later we start leveling off and then start uh, declining. This is not something that India had taken into account. You will see here our then Minister for the Environment, Jayanti Natarajan. And she is surrounded by leaders of the entire world. For one whole day, the negotiations in Cancun were held up because India refused to sign on the dotted line on the grounds that we will not accept binding emission cuts on India. We will not accept targets for emission cuts. And our friend from Grenada, who was chairing the island nation, said, what does that mean, India? Does that mean you develop while we drown? This is what she said. And India was surrounded by all, by developed countries and developing countries, all of whom said India was an obstructionist force because India has been unable to resolve this dilemma in India's position. So, let's cut to Paris and the INDCs themselves. What does India's commitment say in the INDC? The broad headline commitment that India has in its nationally determined contribution is India will reduce the emissions intensity, the intensity of its emissions by between 30 and 35 percent by the year 2030. This is the commitment that India has made. Two things we need to quickly understand. What is this emissions intensity? It doesn't mean an absolute reduction in emissions. Emissions intensity is a ratio of total emissions divided by the GDP. That is, for each unit of GDP, each thousand dollars or million dollars, however you define it, of GDP, how much emissions are you having? So in effect, you're saying our economy will become more energy efficient. If we double our GDP, earlier we would have doubled our emissions, now we will not double them, we will only increase our emissions by 30%, meaning thereby that our economy will become more efficient, energy efficient, by reducing our energy consumption and thereby by reducing uh, energy. Now how good a target is that? Very briefly, at Copenhagen, we had made a pledge saying we will decline our emissions intensity by 20 to 25 percent by the year 2020. So if you look at that rate and you look at the rate at which we have said we will reduce at Paris is not very different. So it's not as if since Copenhagen India has got more ambitious that we will make a big commitment. At the same time India has not gone backwards and reduced its target. To my mind, it's a modest target, doable target, it can be done. And the INDC that India has submitted itself says that in the last decade or so, from 2005 onwards, our emissions intensity has been declining by about 2.5% per annum. Whereas what we are promising now is a decline of only about 1.5 percent per annum. So we should be able to easily achieve uh, the broad headline target that we have uh, set. And what are the, of course, the INDC, if you look at the document, it has a whole wish list. We'll do this, we'll do this, we'll do this, we'll do this, we'll do this. Some of these wishes have numbers attached to them. The other wishes are just uh, statements saying we will also do this and this will have a positive effect on reducing emissions. The numbers that we have set forth are, one, we have set a hugely ambitious target of renewable energy. That is, we need to make more electricity, but we will not do so by increasing coal-fired power plants, but by increasing solar 
and wind. Today, solar and wind put together account for about 5% of total energy production, electricity production by India. This government has promised that's about uh, 5,000 plus to 7,000 megawatts of electricity generation, solar, wind uh, combined. We have said we will increase this during Manmohan Singh's government in the National Action Plan on Climate Change, a target was set of hiking solar to 20,000 megawatts from 5,000 by 2020. That itself was considered a big target. The Modi government has said by 2022, not even by 2030, which is the ceiling set by the Paris, by the INDCs for the Paris Agreement, we will increase solar and wind generation to 175,000 megawatts from 5,000. Just look at the scale at which the expansion is taking place, of which 100,000 megawatts is going to be solar, about 60,000 megawatts is going to be wind, and the others will be biomass and decentralized, uh, etc. 175,000 megawatts. It's a huge jump. Nobody knows how realistic uh, this is. But a promise has been made that this is what India is going to achieve. And in fact, if India actually achieves this target, this headline target of 30 to 33 percent will actually go up to 41 percent. We will exceed our INDC target with just this one measure by 2030 because this target is for 2022. So obviously after that also you still got another eight years uh, to grow. We can discuss later how realistic or otherwise this is, given the fact that till now, since independence, every power generation target that India has announced, we have achieved less than 50% uh, of that. Uh, how far we are going to do this, we don't know. At the same time, we must take into account also the fact that internationally, prices of solar power generation are dropping like a stone. Today, setting up a solar power plant and generating solar in terms of installed capacity is not very much more expensive than a coal plant. The problem is installed capacity doesn't translate to electricity delivered in solar because solar works only 50% of the time. When the sun is out, uh, what do you do at night? Uh, so 50% of that installed capacity is dead. Uh, in any case. So fluctuations there, same with wind. When the wind blows, you'll get power. When the wind doesn't blow, you will not get. Uh, so installed capacity doesn't translate into delivered uh, electricity. This is another factor to be taken into account. A third factor to be taken into account is from the Modi government's Make in India uh, program, not a single kilo of solar cell raw material is made in this country. So this entire capacity of solar generation is going to be based on imported uh, solar cells, 95% of which is going to come from China. The second major commitment made in the INDC is to increase forest oblique tree cover to 33%. Please note forest oblique tree cover. INDC does not speak of forest cover and does not speak of tree cover. And we all know a bunch of trees does not make a forest. I can plant 20,000 eucalyptus trees in this campus, it will not make for a forest. If I cut down 100 acres of forest and plant equivalent amount of eucalyptus trees somewhere, I have not compensated for the loss of forest. So what does this mean? This 33% forest oblique tree cover is not at all clear uh, in this. Then there is talk of, a, of energy efficiency in which India has been historically good, not because of climate change arguments, 
but because india wants to conserve energy india is a very energy import dependent uh, country so our steel industry cement industry uh, have been increasing their efficiencies in order to be competitive uh, in the world and in steel and cement both indian manufacturing sectors are today number 1 and number 2 position in the whole world in terms of how much energy you spend per ton of uh, production so that we are going to continue plus all the energy efficiency in appliances air conditioners uh, star ratings uh, and so on these are the three major initiatives rest of them is all kinds of stuff the only one which is emphasized is the industrial corridors delhi mumbai and the uh, calcutta to amritsar industrial corridors along which a railway line would be uh, constructed which will be a dedicated freight corridor and the indc talks of a 6% shift of freight transportation from road to rail which as you all know is going to be more efficient but the indc makes no such promise about shifting passenger traffic from road to rail which would have benefited the poor uh, rather than just the industrial uh, class but which could have been tackled uh, here so there are some very contrary signals from ongoing uh, programs and some big missed opportunities the indcs presented to us an opportunity to look at cross linkages at uh, what are called co benefits if i do this for example if i shift 10% of uh, road transport from road to rail for passengers i achieve energy efficiency i reduce emissions i also benefit a huge number of traveling public particularly the poor so i get an inclusiveness benefit or an equity dividend so i get multiple benefits from doing one action we have missed great opportunities to do similar things to rethink our developmental pathway but we have not done that in making out our uh, indcs so as i said the big problem area for me is we have missed out equity internationally india has been the big champion of equity talking about the big difference between the poor and the rich and the developed and the developing when it comes to our own country we are not looking at equity we have waxed eloquent at the fact that the average american consumes 17 times more energy than the average indian and therefore the average american is responsible for 17 times the emissions of the average indian but the question is who is this average indian and is not the urban indian in delhi 10 time consuming 10 times more energy than his brother in the rural uh, areas and should not the urban indian then take a greater responsibility for reducing emissions than the rural uh, his rural counterpart where is this reflected in our uh, indcs it is uh, not so for example we have talked a lot about generating electricity but we have not spoken in the indc about who this electricity is for we have made the usual statement this government has also said we will provide electricity for all by 2022 forgive me for being skeptical but i have heard this for the last 15 years every government in every five year plan has come and said we will do electricity for all in the next five years we are nowhere near uh, that scenario if you remember about a few months ago the prime minister in one of his radio uh, talks man ki baat uh, talks named a particular village uh, in up which he said did not have electricity and now it does and how the villagers are so happy some bright spark in the newspaper went and visited that village and found there was no electricity there which just goes to show that there is a huge gap between the promise and the reality so when government speaks it speaks about village electrification 
But if a village gets electrified, it doesn't mean households in that village get electrified. There will be a pole in that village, a wire is coming to that pole, and that's it. From the pole, there are no wires going to the households giving them. So on paper, 92% of India's villages are electrified, but only 54% of households get electricity in this country. And when they get electricity, they may get it for one hour a day, two hours a day. They may get voltage at 140 when tube lights will not uh, light up. So quality of electricity is something I'm not even speaking of yet. But India has just signed on to the sustainable development goals. One of the big gap areas in the Millennium Development Goals was energy access was not one of the MDGs. Energy access is one of the goals in the SDGs. And a big campaign was led by many uh, organizations, civil society groups world over to make sure energy is included. It is now. India is on board. We are a signatory and we need to hold uh, the government's feet to the fire in terms of this promise that the Indian government has uh, made. The issue is, we all talk about trickle-down economics and we know that GDP growth does not translate into poverty removal because we say trickle-down economics does not work. Similarly, trickle-down energy will not work either. If I produce more electricity, it will just get consumed by those who already have more electricity. People who have one air conditioner will buy two air conditioners. People who have two will buy a third one uh, and so on. It will not reach the have-nots, the electricity have-nots, unless you make special efforts. And I wish the INDC had spoken about what the government proposes to do to actually, because that would have then strengthened your argument internationally saying, this is the argument that India has been saying abroad. We need to develop. We need to eradicate poverty. That's why our emissions are likely to go. But where is that evidenced in the INDC that we have uh, put up? It is not. Uh, buildings, the other uh, area. We, then, we know we have green building codes. I believe there is one right here on our... Uh, uh, IP is uh, yeah. Shamir Pit campus is green building. Right, a green building. We have several such green buildings. You have a building code now. Uh, it's called ECBC, Energy Conservation Building Code. But these building codes are for commercial and office buildings with more than 20,000 square meters of area, which consume at least 100 uh, kilowatts of uh, load. Those green building codes are there, but in the residential sector, there are no norms. So houses are being built. Multi-storied apartments are being built. And those of us who have visited any of these new apartments, particularly in my neighborhood in Gurgaon, they're all high-rise steel and glass and concrete structures which consume huge amounts of electricity in uh, summer. It's the opposite of what we should be doing. We should be building with different materials, using hollow bricks and blocks and so on to reduce the electricity load. We have made no rules uh, for this. I just wanted you to note that estimates are that 50 to 70 percent more housing, the total housing load that India is going to have by the year 2050, 50 to 70 percent of that is still to be built. So this is a great opportunity. If we don't take this opportunity now, we have locked in that much carbon for the next 50 years. This is a time to intervene. I was fortunately or unfortunately a member of the previous government's planning commission had set up a committee called the Committee Expert Group on Low Carbon Inclusive Development to meet the Copenhagen uh, Agreement. This was one of the first demands civil society groups like ours put forward. It was flatly ruled out by the government. They said, don't touch the building sector because the building sector is an engine of growth of the Indian economy. Uh, big opportunity has been missed and continues to be missed even today. My argument still remains, if a house buyer can spend 40 lakhs to buy a flat, he can also pay 43 lakhs. It won't make much difference to the EMI 
that he gives, if that's the extra that it's going to cost to make it. So once again, here's an opportunity where the better off could have taken more of the burden of reducing energy and therefore emissions, but we have not done so in our uh, INDCs. The forest and green cover I've already talked to you about. We already know that there is an ongoing problem of rapid diversion of uh, forests for industrial uh, activities, for mining, for development, for urban expansion and so on. In, the, in light of that, what are we going to do? INDC talks of these, the green highways project. So you build highways and you line them with trees on either side. And this is supposed to compensate for the forests that you have, uh, which clearly it does not. Uh, please remember, forest areas which are being denuded today support directly and indirectly the livelihoods and support systems for close to 250 million people in India who live in or on the fringes of the forest. It's a deep blow to equity which is currently uh, going on and which the INDC takes no measure to address. In fact, looks at it the other way. Transport, I've already spoken of, no role given for rail passenger uh, share. On the other hand, metros are being expanded even in cities which may not be able to afford uh, metros. No mention is made of bus transportation. Even state capitals in India don't have uh, bus uh, transportation, uh, which is badly needed uh, in this. Aviation is being given a boost. You've seen the recent announcement of regional connectivity and so on. A bullet train has been promised in the Mumbai, Ahmedabad and Delhi, Varanasi uh, sectors. So there is no effort at looking at transportation as a whole. Look at air, road, rail, rationalize these, look at what's the benefit for the common man, what's the benefit for mitigation, and what is the cost involved and rationalize uh, between them. No effort to do so. Uh, again, there is a big emphasis on uh, biofuels and an aspirational target has been set of 20% biofuel blending. India has not yet been able to achieve 10% blending for petrol by ethanol, we have hardly achieved 5%. INDC talks of 20%, which can only be done by dedicating more land to grow fuel rather than land to grow food. And once again, I believe this is an anti-equity uh, measure uh, in the INDCs. As I said, I think the INDC was a great opportunity to rethink our development trajectory look at development holistically, what do we want to achieve, and simultaneously target mitigation, reduction of carbon, economic growth, equity, that is to promote energy access uh, among the have-nots, to local environment and health, to promote all these simultaneously rather than as the INDC does, just look at mitigation, reduction of carbon dioxide as a goal. It doesn't matter whether we achieve that at the cost of equity or the cost of the poor uh, or not. Focus is mainly, as I said, unidimensional and basically oriented towards mitigation, adopting a trickle-down approach to energy, just like a trickle-down approach in uh, economics. So what I'm really arguing is, if you are looking at climate justice, I would argue that we are not just looking at a green vision. Just look at everything from an environmentalist or a carbon reduction point of view, but also look at a social justice dimension to this. Unless you combine environmental justice with social justice, you will not be able to achieve the goals that we are all uh, looking for. Thank you. I'm going to stop. There.